If you're in business, you probably have a website, but can your site handle your growth? How many visitors before your site slows down or crashes? What about storage and data security? From web hosting to virtual servers, Pair Networks provides the online infrastructure you need to start, grow, and flourish. When it comes to security and updates, don't worry, we've got you covered. Our 24-7 U.S.-based customer support is the best in the industry. No frustrating chatbots are sitting on hold for hours. Check out Pair.com today to learn more. That's P-A-I-R dot com. Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you can attend Attitude's weekly ADHD Experts webinar. Today's topic is absolutely essential for all of us to know about. Adults, parents, teens, children, even doctors, maybe especially doctors. We all know about the challenges of being diagnosed with ADHD, executive function challenges, emotional ones, hyperactivity, and attentiveness and impulsivity. What is new and vitally important to understand is that ADHD increases our risks for health and medical impairments. The science suggests that attention deficit actually predisposes us to personality traits and lifestyle choices that have a significant impact on health-related factors affecting life expectancy. Today, Dr. Russell Barkley will discuss the science behind the link between ADHD and health impairment and life expectancy. Just as important, he will discuss the implications for changing how we manage and treat ADHD based on these health risks. First, though, I have to tell you about today's webinar sponsor. It's Play Attention the most comprehensive program available for both children and adults designed to strengthen executive function and self-regulation. Strong executive function, as you know, is essential in our ability to pay attention and helps us regulate, control, and manage our thoughts and actions. Play Attention customizes everyone's plan to improve specific cognitive skills that last a lifetime. Call 800-788-6786 and learn how they can customize their program for you, your child, or your clients. Play Attention provides you with a personal executive function coach for free, unlimited support. Go to www.playattention.com for more information. And just so you know, Attitude webinar sponsors have no role in the selection of guest speakers, the speaker's presentation, or any other aspect of the webinar production. Now let me introduce Dr. Barkley. He's a clinical professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the Virginia Treatment Center for Children and Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine in Richmond, Virginia. Dr. Barkley is a clinical scientist, educator, and practitioner who has published 23 books, rating scales, and clinical manuals. He is an internationally recognized authority on ADHD in children and adults. Basically, if it relates to ADHD, Dr. Barkley knows about it. So with all that being said, let me turn over today's webinar to Dr. Barkley. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Wayne. Uh, As the introduction said, I'm going to be speaking to you today about the health outcomes of ADHD and what this means for life expectancy and for management. This is a topic that has rarely received much attention until this past year, as a result of some new research has come to light uh, on this topic, mainly by my research team, uh, Mary Ellen Fisher and I, working on our Milwaukee Longitudinal Study following ADHD children into young adulthood. Now, for many years, we've known that ADHD is associated with a variety of impairments in major life activities, a sample of which you can see here. Uh, We know that ADHD is related to developmental delays in language and motor coordination in particular, but also in independence and self-help skills known as adaptive skills. Young children with ADHD can be very dysregulated or uh, difficult to manage, and as a result, we often see greater family strife, stress, uh, and uh, difficulties within the family around compliance Uh, and command situations and just generally more disruptive behavior as a result of the child's unregulated behavioral problems. By the time the child enters school, it's well known that ADHD is associated with low academic success, overall greater school maladjustment, 
Uh, and about half of these children are likely to have one or more learning disabilities in addition to their ADHD. And then, of course, by the time the child reaches second grade, it's not unusual to begin to see peer relationship problems if they have not emerged already uh, in about half of these children. Uh, and if they have oppositional defiant disorder, that figure can rise to 70% or more of them having relationship difficulties and no close friends. Now, besides that, over time, we begin to see the emergence of other psychiatric disorders linking up with ADHD. Indeed, over 80% of ADHD children will have at least one or more other psychiatric learning or developmental problems in addition to their ADHD. The most common, of course, is oppositional disorder, learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, and conduct problems as well. Those who develop these conduct problems also tend to drift into antisocial behavior in the community, often known as delinquency, uh, and this occurs in up to 40% of ADHD youth uh, by the time they reach age 16. So it's not uncommon to see a small subset of them moving into antisocial activity. Now, by adulthood, we also see some additional difficulties besides the ones I've met already. There, of course, is a growing risk for use of tobacco and alcohol because of the risk-taking behavior and impulsivity associated with ADHD and possibly even a growing risk for marijuana use as well. Of course, if the child has developed conduct problems already, then there might be an increased use for or increased likelihood of other substance use disorders besides the three that I've already mentioned here. Once the child becomes really active, we see a uh, increased pattern of risky sexual activity, including earlier age and intercourse, less likely to use contraception, changing sexual partners more often than is typical, all of which predisposes to a 32% risk of having a pregnancy or baby by 19 years of age, uh, and about a fourfold increase in a risk of sexually transmitted disease, somewhere between 17 to 20% of these individuals. Once they get their driver's license, you can imagine that impulsive, inattentive, distractible people would have more difficulty driving, and that is certainly true for youth with ADHD, where we say see a growing risk of speeding tickets about four times greater than is typical of other teenagers, about two to three times more crashes in their first eight years of driving, and then as they get older, a greater likelihood of driving under the influence. So ADHD is predisposing to all of these risks besides those childhood risks. And by the time they reach adulthood, it's well known that many, though not all, people with ADHD have difficulties with occupational functioning, with managing their finances and credit, and then if they begin cohabiting or living with an intimate partner or become married, there is a growing risk of marital dissatisfaction, and a small subset of them seem to be at risk for intimate partner violence. Should they go on to have children, there's ample research now to show that ADHD interferes with a individual's ability to typically parent uh, a typical child. Uh, and we find, of course, the distractible, impulsive, and emotional symptoms of ADHD in the parent are likely to lead to conflict and behavioral difficulties with their child. So all of this is to say that ADHD is known to predispose to a variety of impairments across the lifespan. And certainly every person with ADHD does not experience every one of these difficulties, but they are more likely to do so than our typical comparison individuals in our control groups. Now, beyond these problems with educational, social, occupational, and family problems, among others, Research has begun to show that people with ADHD may be at greater risk for having a shortened life expectancy. Uh, and among those uh, things that uh, have been looked at in research, we see that people with ADHD have a high risk for traumatic brain injuries, uh, and not necessarily just because they're more likely to play sports or engage in motorsports or because of their risky driving, but just a greater proneness to accidental injuries in general. Uh, indeed, it's been shown that about a third of all children who go to emergency rooms for injuries are likely to be ADHD children. So it's not uncommon for these children to have had several 
injuries prior to growing up. In addition, as I've already said, there is a risk in a subset of children for antisocial behavior, including violent behavior toward others. And this, of course, could increase problems with injury back to themselves as well. And that would also create health concerns for the individual, of course. And I mentioned the growing risk for teenage pregnancy, which comes also with the risk for contracting sexually transmitted disease. Those, of course, are additional health risks that individuals with ADHD may be likely to have as they grow up. In general, by young adulthood, we found that children with ADHD as young adults reported a lot more physical health problems, including just general complaints about headaches, vague stomach aches, uh, and other vague medical complaints, particularly if they were likely to be experiencing anxiety and depression. There's also a small amount of research to show that there might be an increase in risk for fibromyalgia syndrome in people with ADHD. Again, seems to be more related to their impulsivity and more likely to occur in females than in males. As you see here, there's also a risk in ADHD for migraine headaches. Recent studies this year show that this risk is because of shared genetics between the genes for ADHD and the genes for migraine. So there may be some genetic predispositions toward these health problems besides their association with uh, impulsive behavior. More recent studies also have shown that people with ADHD are likely to consume a very unhealthy diet, or what we call a Western diet, of very high-carbohydrate high foods, fast foods, uh, the kind of foods that we discourage people in eating if they were trying to lose weight. Uh, in addition, of course, because of their exposure to high-carb diets and to high-sugar diets, they are more likely to have problems with their dental care, increased dental plaque, more cavities, uh, possibly more dental trauma because of their risk-taking and accidental injury, and just poorer attention to their overall oral health and hygiene than we see in other people. Some studies are now showing that ADHD predisposes to obesity and that this risk increases uh, over the lifespan. So the risk for obesity is very small in children, but by adolescence, adolescence it begins to increase. By adulthood, they're two to three times more likely to be obese than other individuals. In my own Milwaukee study, for instance, we found that at least 40% or more had problems with obesity, uh, and that has been replicated in other studies as well. Uh, and indeed, the reverse is true. If you go to obesity clinics and you study the patients who go there, about 32% of them are likely to be adults with ADHD. So there's a two-way street here between ADHD and risk of obesity. Also, in some recent studies, we have seen an increased risk for type 2 diabetes. This may be because of the uh, Western-style high-carbohydrate diet that leads to obesity, but also a study published just a month or two ago suggested that there might also be some shared genetics between the genes for ADHD and the genes for type 2 diabetes. So there could be both a lifestyle risk that's increasing this occurrence of diabetes, as well as underlying shared genetic risk as well. As my slide indicates, not only is obesity a problem, but for females, so is the likelihood of eating pathology and specifically a binge eating disorder uh, such as bulimia. Not much risk for anorexia with this disorder, but of course, because of the ulcivedness, there is this risk for binge eating particularly in females. And as you can see here, it's about 10 to 20% of ADHD females by adolescence uh, are complaining about binge eating disorder. I've already mentioned the growing risk for the use of tobacco, uh, alcohol, and marijuana. Uh, and that, of course, is going to pose ongoing health problems. And those health problems are going to increase the more chronic the use of these substances happens to be. We also know that people with ADHD have more difficulty quitting the use of these substances than do other individuals. Uh, and of course, as you would th think, if you're going to be smoking more and drinking more at some point in your later life, this is going to pose a greater chance of developing cancer uh, and coronary heart disease. So that just makes perfect sense if those lifestyle factors are continuing. And indeed, our Milwaukee follow-up study did find a higher risk 
for ongoing cardiovascular disease or coronary heart disease. We found lower high density lipids, which is the good type of cholesterol. A greater likelihood of hypertension has been found in other studies. And we reported a greater uh, risk for atherosclerotic plaques, uh, which as you know, is the uh, sclerosis of the arteries that is more likely to predispose to heart attack uh, and other forms of heart disease and stroke. Research also shows that people with low self-control, like those with ADHD, also have this greater risk for coronary heart disease uh, or events. So there's a lot of evidence converging that ADHD is going to uh, increase the likelihood that someone might have cancer and coronary heart disease. As you see here, a couple of studies, not many, but a few suggest that in late life, there might be a somewhat higher risk for the development of dementia than is seen in the general population. That, of course, could be related to all of these health problems, which in many ways are known to predispose toward late life dementia, particularly smoking, uh, but also there may be some shared underlying genetic risk here as well. Overall, there's just an increased risk for disorders of the central part of the brain known as the basal ganglia and the cerebellum disorders like Parkinson's disease, for instance, that arise from this region in the brain that is the, the basal ganglia. So you can see why people like myself have to wonder about it. What do all of these risk factors begin to pose a likelihood that people with ADHD are going to have a shorter life expectancy than the general population? And last month, a study was published in which the entire gene of people with ADHD scanned along with a large sample of control uh, children and adults. And that study also found that not only were people with ADHD likely to have a variety of health problems, but that the parents of people with ADHD were themselves likely to have died at an earlier age than would be expected in the general population. So putting all of this together, my colleague Mary Ellen Fisher and I uh, decided to take a very close look at the children in the Milwaukee follow-up study. We had done complete physical exams on these children uh, at the time we saw them between age 27 and 32, and that allowed us to take a look not only at their health, but begin to convert a lot of our data into the kind of data that a life insurance company would use if they were going to predict your life expectancy in trying to decide whether they were going to insure your life. Uh, and of course, the kinds of variables that uh, insurance companies use uh, would be things like your smoking and your wealth, the things I've already spoken about. We also uh, were interested in looking at life expectancy and the health of our individuals because a few studies, as you see here, already showed that people with ADHD were likely to die young because of accidental injury and that that was related to their poor impulse control. Also, by adolescence and early adulthood, there was a slightly higher risk of uh, suicidal thinking and suicide attempts than in the general population. So all of these things were uh, weighing on our minds when we went back and looked at our data uh, to see whether there was an impact on life expectancy. And here on this slide, you're just seeing some of the recent studies I alluded to in my last comment that are showing a growing risk for early death in the ADHD population. Children with ADHD are nearly twice as likely to die before reaching adulthood because of accidental injuries, and adults with ADHD are more than four times likely to die by age 40, uh, again, largely as a result of accidental injury, although slightly more likely due to increased uh, suicide risk as well. So with all of that in mind, we went back to our Milwaukee study, uh, looked at the health variables, were able to locate a life expectancy calculator I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, and then run all of our data through this life expectancy algorithm to come up with some predictions about life expectancy. And just so you know, such research is very complex. It's never done by one individual such as myself. And you see here my colleagues and collaborators on this longitudinal study. 
If you're not familiar with our study, just very quickly, we're following 158 children into adulthood. We've been seeing them since 1978. We reevaluated them approximately every five years, with the most recent evaluation being at approximately age 27, ranging in age from about age 24 up to age 32. We also have a control group of children that we've been following simultaneously from the same schools and neighborhoods and social classes. So it's a very well-designed study, and we've been able to retain upwards of about 90% or more of the people in each group. By the time they reached adulthood, we were able to sort our ADHD children into those whose ADHD had persisted to age 27, those whose ADHD had declined to the point where they were no longer uh, eligible for a diagnosis. Uh, about 14% of them, in fact, had fully recovered from their disorder by age 27, uh, and we had about uh, 55 to 65 percent of them uh, continuing to be fully ADHD, and the remainder uh, were individuals who, although not eligible for a diagnosis, were in fact still highly symptomatic and impaired. So in the subsequent data that I'm going to show you, uh, we're going to be splitting our ADHD group into a persistent group and a non-persistent group when we compare them to our control group. One of the difficulties that we've been running into in using our data is that we couldn't get hold of very good calculators that are used to predict life expectancy. The insurance companies keep theirs to themselves. They're proprietary, so we couldn't use those. And the ones that are usually found on the internet are very simplistic, are usually associated with the website of some sort of insurance company, so they're commercial, and they just don't suit scientific purposes very well. But about a year ago, the Goldenson Center for Actuarial Research at the University of Connecticut published a non-commercial life expectancy algorithm or calculator that was made free to the public uh, that scientists could use if they wanted to compute life expectancies of various samples. And so we were able to access uh, the use of this calculator. We went through and put all 14 variables into the calculator uh, to come up with our estimates of life expectancy at age 27. And you can see some of the things that we input into the calculator in order to compute one's remaining years of life left by age 27. And a lot of these make sense. Of course, your age, your height, weight, your income level is related to life expectancy, diabetes, uh, your current health and how well you think you're doing, nutrition, exercise, sleep, education, uh, your driving risks, whether or not you smoke. Uh, and if you do smoke, are you smoking more than 20 cigarettes a day? Because that adds an additional number of years off your life expectancy than just if you casually smoke. And then, of course, of alcohol can also reduce life expectancy. So we took all of this data from our large data set, ran it through the calculator, and this is what we found. Now, this graph compares just children with ADHD growing up to the control group. We're not yet dividing the children by persistent ADHD or non-persistent. This just reflects what is the risk of a shorter life expectancy if you were diagnosed with ADHD in childhood. <clears throat> and you can see we have three set bars here. On the left, you see the number of healthy years left in the uh, samples. In the middle, you see the number of unhealthy years that's predicted from this formula. And over on the right would be the combination of those two. What is the total life expectancy in years remaining if you were diagnosed with ADHD in childhood? And it doesn't matter whether you grew up with it or not. This is just childhood diagnosis. So what do we see here? We see here about a nine-year reduction or more in healthy years of life uh, and an increase in unhealthy years of life by about a year. And that all translates to slightly less than nine years of reduced life expectancy uh, in people who were diagnosed with ADHD in childhood. Now, the more interesting graph is this one. This shows when we divide ADHD children into those whose ADHD persisted, which is the darker red bar on the left, uh, and then the middle bar is the group whose ADHD did not persist, and so they were not diagnosable. Some of them still had subthreshold HD, high symptoms, impairment, and so on. 
just didn't meet criteria for the disorder. And then the lighter bar, of course, again, is the control group. So let's look over on that left-hand side, and you can see that if your ADHD persisted into adulthood, you were likely to have 13 years less in life expectancy than the control group. So a much greater reduction in life expectancy if ADHD persists. If it doesn't persist, then you're seeing about a seven to eight year reduction in life expectancy uh, compared to that control group. Uh, so there is a marked impact of ADHD on life expectancy, particularly if it's persisting to young adulthood as it was in our sample. And then over on the right, you see the reduction in total life expectancy, and that is a little over 11 years of reduced life if you had persistent ADHD into young adulthood. So uh, we, were, we were, to say, very sobered by these findings uh, and quite shocked because, uh, although you may not realize it, these are very large figures for reduced life expectancy in the population. <clears throat> for comparison's sake, uh, how much? Well, it's smoking. Smoking reduces your life by about four years. If you smoke more than 20 cigarettes a day, it reduces your life expectancy by about six and a half years. If you drink alcohol to excess, that's probably a couple of years. Morbidly obese, that's a few more years as well. So I want you to notice that ADHD is markedly worse in its effects on life expectancy than all of the major risks that we're concerned about, smoking, alcohol, obesity, nutrition, and so on. Indeed, you can combine the top four risk factors in the population for early death, and ADHD exceeds that combination of those four risk factors. So just to put this in context, ADHD, it's turning out, is markedly worse in its effects on life than all the things we spend billions of dollars on in the U.S. to try to get people to change their lifestyle in order to lead a longer life and a higher quality of life uh, than they might currently be doing. So that's just to put things in context so you fully understand why we were so shocked at these results. And by the way, these are individuals who are largely untreated in adulthood. The majority got some level of treatment in childhood. Remember this is back in the 1970s, 80s when they were children. Mainly back then, it was a few years of medication, possibly some parent training, maybe a few years of special assistance in school. Uh, but in, by the time these kids were graduating high school, less than 15 to 20 percent of them were receiving any intervention whatsoever. And at age 27, only about 5 percent of them, maybe 7 percent, were still in any kind of treatment program, specifically taking ADHD medication. So by adulthood, they're largely an unmedicated group of individuals. And what that shows us, of course, is that if you don't sustain treatment through adolescence into adulthood, that childhood intervention in and of itself, if it is discontinued, really has no impact on an individual's life course outcomes in any domain of impairment, certainly has no impact on their life expectancy. So we decided to back in our study and ask, all right, what is it that was reducing life expectancy in our children? And here are the things that were in the calculator in which the ADHD group was more at risk, had a more adverse um, data or outcomes than the control group. Of course, they had less education, so that was reducing life expectancy, less income overall, greater alcohol use, more likely to smoke, more likely to smoke excessively. Uh, they often reported their health as significantly worse. Uh, they were not getting as much sleep as other individuals, and that over time does have an impact on life expectancy. And of course, I mentioned their driving problems as well. So we can see then that ADHD predisposes to a variety of lifestyle problems, and that those lifestyle problems are leading to a reduction in predicted life expectancy. But we also wanted to look behind those first order lifestyle factors uh, to see, was, was there anything that was predicting why people 
were being predisposed toward engaging in these adverse health practices. And of course, the big one in our study was ADHD itself. Uh, and we did look at that, and that certainly is a major factor. But beyond that, were there any other factors? Uh, and here are the ones that we found. There were four of them, and they actually substituted or replaced ADHD in being the most important factors. And number one, of course, is disinhibition, poor impulse control. That's why ADHD was predisposing people to a shorter lifespan to these other adverse health factors that shorten their life expectancy. They're very impulsive, very risk-taking, lack conscientiousness, don't contemplate their behavior very well, are less able to change their behavior more than others, all because of this greater disinhibition that they have. Notice that we were able to predict just from that one variable, 31% of the variation in life expectancy is due to that, and that's huge. Uh, and then there were some lesser factors like intelligence, interpersonal hostility, working memory that predicted a little bit more variation in life expectancy. But the big one was disinhibition. We also found, and I don't want to get too technical here, we also found that two genes that are risk genes for ADHD are also adding additional prediction to shortening lifespan. And this is independent of their association with ADHD. So they're additive with ADHD, they're, they're not substituting for ADHD. Uh, and two of the genes here were the dopamine transporter known as DAT1 uh, and the DBH dopamine beta hydroxylase gene. Uh, and these two genes were shortening life expectancy by as much as an additional two to five years if the person had certain variations in these genes. And those are the variations we often see in ADHD. Uh, so again, on average, about an 11 to 13 year reduction in life expectancy if your ADHD persists into adulthood. If you, in addition to that, have these other risk genes, it shortens your life expectancy by another two to five years beyond that. Now, of course, any study like mine has a number of limitations. I don't want to use this seminar to go through them in any detail, but I did it to acknowledge uh, that every scientific study has some flaws in it. And these are the likely limitations of our study uh, that affected our results and that uh, would lead us to recommend our study be replicated by other scientists. So I, I don't want to really spend any uh, further time on them. Uh, but they're there, and you can read them in the scientific paper that we published at the Journal of Attention Disorders, uh, where we go through all of them in detail for scientists to be aware of. Now, so that's the bad news, and, and that is ADHD, for the first time in history, has now been linked to a shorter life expectancy as a result of these chronic lifestyle adversities that we've identified as linked to ADHD. And that ADHD is worse than any single other life expectancy risk factor that we are concerned about as a population. Diabetes, smoking, obesity, alcohol use, and so on. ADHD is worse than, than all of them. The good news is that most of these risk factors can be changed very simply. And that is by working with individuals with ADHD to alter these factors that are foreshadowing a shortened life expectancy if they don't change their lifestyle, behavior, and habits. After all, you can get more education, you can lose weight, you can improve your nutrition, you can increase your exercise, you can find ways to improve your sleep quality and duration, you can treat ADHD and reduce the risk of driving problems. We can also treat smoking and help people quit smoking or at least cut down on smoking and cut down on their alcohol use as well and improve their overall current health. So everything that we saw in our ADHD kids that's predisposing to a shorter lifespan, the vast majority of those things can be changed with help, if necessary, from primary health care providers and others who assist the population in this kind of risk reduction. So the good news is we can change all of this. We can help people lead a normal life, a normal life expectancy and a higher quality of life. But we also have to pay attention 
attention to the fact that if you look behind all of these first-order lifestyle risk factors for shorter lifespan, the big factor is ADHD and especially its linkage with behavioral inhibition problems, or what we often call conscientiousness, low conscientiousness, is the personality trait linked here. So that means that we can't just focus on the life factors if we're going to help these people. We also need to lower this personality trait so that they are less likely to engage in these other factors. And that means we have to treat their ADHD in adulthood to help get this risk reduction. Clinicians don't realize this. They often focus on the specific lifestyle factor. They want to help you lose weight. They want to help quit smoking, reduce your alcohol consumption, eat better, and so on. But what if the person continually fails? Clinicians don't know that the person who's likely to fail in these self-change programs is the young adult with ADHD and especially high levels of disinhibition. So they don't screen for it. And as a result, they're likely to blame the patient for lack of motivation or not willing to try to change their lifestyle. So what have we learned in this presentation? We've known for several decades that ADHD is a disorder of the executive function system of the brain, which gives us our self-regulation. So ADHD isn't just an attention disorder. It's a self-regulation disorder, and especially problems with behavioral inhibition and self-control. As a result of these self-regulation problems, ADHD is predisposing people to all kinds of adverse outcomes in education, family functioning, peer relationships, uh, and then going on further difficulties with driving, antisocial behavior, a risky sexual activity, occupational functioning. I've listed all those before, but to that list, we can now add that ADHD also increases risk for adverse health and lifestyle behaviors, and that through those, ADHD is going to have a negative impact on expected <clears throat> life by the time they reach young adulthood. Uh, and this, by the way, is in addition to the risk we already identified for accidental injury and suicide. Uh, so combine all of those, and you're looking at a very high-risk individual uh, with ADHD. Uh, and then, as our study showed specifically, uh, ADHD in childhood is likely to reduce your lifespan by nine years. And if it persists into adulthood, it's going to be upwards of about 13 years of reduced healthy lifespan. So what does this mean for our care of people with ADHD? The first thing it tells us is that ADHD can no longer be looked at as just a mental health problem. ADHD is now a public health problem. It's worse than all the other public health factors that we pay attention to. Our government spends billions of dollars trying to get the population to change that medical insurance companies try to improve in order to reduce their costs and improve the lifespans and quality of life of their insurance. ADHD is worse than all of them because ADHD involves most, if not all, of these other lifestyle factors that we care about if we want to improve our lifespan and our quality of life. So as you can see here then, uh, ADHD is about two and a half times worse than the top four killers in the U.S. combined. Uh, and so we need to pay attention to that. We need to make sure that, first of all, patients and families and adults with ADHD get this message. They already know about the educational help or, or occupational and social problems. They're probably not aware of the health problems that go with ADHD as well. Maybe if they were aware, they might be more likely to engage in treatment and to sustain their treatment. But first and foremost, it's the people with ADHD and those who love them that need to understand these additional risks beyond the ones we already know about. Second, we need to educate primary care providers into recognizing the role of ADHD in contributing to reduced health, increased risk, 
of disease and shorter life expectancy. We need to encourage them to screen for ADHD in any patient they're working with to try to improve their lifestyle, such as quitting smoking. Any patient they work with <clears throat> that seems to fail in their initial efforts to change that lifestyle factor, then the physician needs to screen to see if ADHD is the reason that person is struggling to try to improve their life. Uh, and usually it will be a risk factor there for those individuals. So I'm not saying screen everybody, but I am saying screen those who fail the first attempt at self-change because the physician may now need to treat the ADHD if it's identified in order to help that patient not only control their ADHD, but also <clears throat> to improve all of these lifestyle and risk factors. Now, as you see at the bottom of my slide, we also need to educate other mental health professionals, not just the patients, about these risks so that they broaden their assessments to look at health, quality of life, and these lifestyle risks that I've identified here, and then begin to include recommendations in their treatment package uh, that they ordinarily would recommend for managing ADHD uh, as well. So treating ADHD and especially its behavioral inhibition component, including with ADHD medications, we believe may help to facilitate a reduction in these uh, health and lifestyle risk factors, may be able to improve the ability of people with ADHD to change their life for the better and to reduce these factors. Uh, because we know that ADHD is the most treatable psychiatric disorder that we are aware of. It has more treatments, more medications specifically, that have a much greater impact on the disorder than other drugs for other psychiatric disorders have, with a greater percentage of people with ADHD responding to these uh, medications and other interventions as well, so that there is great hope here for managing this disorder and through that, reducing these lifestyle factors and therefore improving the expectancy of these individuals. The greatest problem we have right now in this country is not that we don't have adequate treatments for ADHD. We do. It's that most people with ADHD don't get access to the combination of treatments that they are likely to need to benefit overall in improving their ADHD and their lifestyle. This is especially true for that critical age group of teens and young adults where we see the growing risk for these lifestyle adversities that are predisposing to a shorter life expectancy. So I thank you for joining me at this time uh, and let people enter their questions. Um Parents, as you would imagine, they, they heard sort of the bad news, the eye-opening news. They wanted any kind of positive things they can do for their child or their teen or themselves as a young adult. Uh, I think you might have answered this, but I, what are the most effective treatments for disinhibition? I know you mentioned medication. Mm -hmm. Do you want to expand on that? And are there any psychosocial approaches yes. that you would recommend? Yes. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. And I know, because I've been this talk a few times this year already, that the first reaction of the audience is shock. Uh, and that was our first reaction to these results. So that's understandable. These are very eye-opening, very sobering results when you think about them. Uh, and I think what makes them uh, so shocking is that nobody talked about this before. Uh, we talked about accidental injuries and risk for suicide over the last few years as those data became available, but not life expectancy overall. And so I understand that natural reaction, but let's not forget the second part of the program where I emphasize repeatedly that these are changeable risks that we've identified here. Uh, and while you can't change your age or your sex, uh, all of the other factors that we were using and that life insurance companies use to project lifespan can be changed. Uh, you can start tomorrow doing these things. First of all, you can address all of those risk factors I mentioned, which were sleep, weight, smoking, alcohol use, nutrition, education, and so on. Every single one of those can be targeted for change. 
and we have programs to change them. In fact, that's all you hear in January when everybody's doing their New Year's resolutions is about weight loss and nutrition and exercise and gym memberships and cutting your smoking and reducing your alcohol. It's all over the place out there. All I want to do is say, all right, we need to get serious about ADHD specifically and not just go after the general population because the ADHD people are markedly more likely to have these problems. The second thing is the treatments we have, including the medications, do help inhibition as much as they help attention because they target these executive deficits. And specifically, we're talking here not just about the ADHD meds, but also about things for adults like cognitive behavioral therapy and adult ADHD coaching or certainly two things that can be added with medication to help boost the effects of the medication to get even more improvement in these areas. In the case of children, of course, we know the standard evidence-based approaches are school behavior management programs, behavioral parent training programs that can be combined with medication in order to further improve the ADHD symptoms and specifically the inhibitory problems of these individuals. So yes, recommending a treatment package, not just medication alone. And while medication is the most effective piece of that package, its effects can be boosted as we've seen in many studies by adding in these other additional components. So again, there is great hope here for using combined intervention with ADHD, but don't forget my important message. It's treatment during adolescence and adulthood that matters the most. If you're just going to treat for a couple of years with a child and then stop treatment from there on, you really have not altered these risk factors anyway. So we've got to bridge those crucial years if we're going to have an impact on any domain of functioning, not just on their health uh, and their life expectancy. So that was a very good question. Was the risk just as high in um, inattentive versus hyperactive ADHD? Okay, well, that, that's also a good question. But first of all, let me preface it by saying is uh, we don't recognize three kinds of ADHD anymore. Uh, and the DSM-5 published uh, six years ago makes that very clear. Uh, ADHD varies from moment to moment, from year to year, in which of the two dimensions of symptoms are likely to be most problematic. So you can have a hyperactive presentation, but that can move on in a couple of years to be a combined presentation. And as that person grows up, the hyperactivity decreases and it becomes an inattentive presentation. Still the same disorder. Uh, there, there are very few differences across these presentations. And indeed, most people go through all three of them. So we don't recognize subtypes of ADHD mm -hmm. any longer that are qualitatively different. It's a single disorder in the population that has two highly related symptom dimensions. People almost always have both symptom dimensions, but there is a subset of individuals who only are inattentive and who never in their life had difficulties with impulsivity or hyperactivity or self-regulation problems. And while people continue to call that inattentive presentation, I know clinicians call it ADD, they shouldn't. ADD is the original name for ADHD from 1980, so that's just confusing. Uh, what we have recognized is that about half of these inattentive only people who never had any impulse control problems have a new attention disorder called sluggish cognitive tempo that you can read about on my website under the fact sheets. You can go to YouTube and see several recent presentations I've made on this other attention disorder. It's very different from ADHD, but it is almost always misdiagnosed as ADHD inattentive presentation. Uh, it is not treatable the way ADHD is with the same treatments. Uh, and there are many other differences I don't have time to go into mm -hmm. here. So please mm -hmm. read up about that because our study did not involve that kind of inattentive only SCT, sluggish cognitive tempo type individual. But it did include the combined type and the hyperactive type and the inattentive people who were hyperactive or combined earlier in life, but who might by young adulthood or adolescence now be just inattentive. So certainly all of those people we could uh, see represented in our study, but not that sluggish cognitive tempo group. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, mom asks, I have put off driving for my 17-year-old with ADHD as long as I can, but now I need to deal with this if I expect him to hold a job. Any suggestions yes. on how to proceed? Um, there's a variety of suggestions. There was even a book out many years ago. It might still be available by Marlene Snyder on the driving risk to do about them. Uh, it's a bit dated, but it's the only one I know of out there. Uh, I, I, I think ADHD individuals are the highest risk drivers on the roadways, particularly when they are not being treated while they are driving. Uh, and just admonishing them to drive better and sending them back through driver's education isn't going to change these risks at all because it's not a knowledge problem. It's a performance problem when they're out driving. So, yes, you want them to stay with their learners permit longer and then gradually move up to independent driving during the daytime, but no other teens or young adults in the car. If they can handle that for six months without problems, then maybe we'll increase that to nighttime driving. They can handle that. Then they can have other teens in the car uh, and so on. So it's a graduated approach that looks at a period of about two years ago in which we are restricting or limiting the driving of the individual until they show us that they can handle that level or the next level of independent driving. The second thing we want them to do is the most effective thing improving driving is to be on medication when you're operating that vehicle. No other treatment we have found has been able to reduce driving risks to the extent that that is able to do. And indeed, Canadian pediatricians recommend that if a child is at least moderate ADHD or higher and they are of driving age, they need to be on medication while they drive. And I certainly would agree with that sort of approach to managing driving. This is a life-threatening area, not only for the driver or other people out there as well. I lost my twin brother in an auto accident due to his ADHD. I want to see this happen to anybody else. So parents need to do what this parent did, take it very seriously. You can let them drive, greater supervision, on medication, and then most importantly, you need to block their access to their cell phones and other uh, technology that they may have in the car. Don't just tell them not to use their phone or text while driving or make calls while driving. Uh, you need to take a more active step because just admonishing them to not do this does not work. There are now devices you can buy on the Internet. They're inexpensive. They plug into the dashboard of the car, and when the car is turned on, they will block all cell phone signals in that car. So you have to get the road and turn off the motor to make a call. I would encourage parents to look for those. In addition, there are apps you can download from app stores that will do the same thing. If that phone is moving at a higher rate of speed than you can walk, then it will shut down that phone and you won't be able to make calls or use it. So I encourage parents to use those apps and set them up with parental controls and not just rely on the promises of the teen not to text and drive because we know they won't follow those rules. Uh, and those are about the best things you can do at this point in time uh, in order to uh, manage the driving. You could take this up a notch if you wanted to. For $300, you can put a GoPro-type camera in the car that records your child. There are many insurance companies that will use these dash cam recorders uh, with you, and you can monitor your teen while they're out driving using your laptop, uh, at, or you can wait till they get home and pull out the little hard drive, you know, the little flash drive, and look at it on your laptop and see how they were actually driving. Uh, just having this in the car and knowing that they're being monitored probably would increase the quality of their driving. So there's a lot of these higher tech solutions that you can also go to, but at the very least, greater supervision, be on medication, block the use of cell phones while they drive are some of the big three I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm afraid the hour is up. Thanks so much for being here and sharing your great expertise in that wonderful study to open people's My eyes. My pleasure. You're Once welcome. Again, Glad today's to webinar sponsor is Play Attention, the most comprehensive program available for both children and adults designed to strengthen executive function and self-regulation. As you know, strong executive function is essential in our ability to pay attention, helps us regulate, control, and manage our thoughts and actions. Play Attention customizes everyone's plan 
to improve specific cognitive skills that last a lifetime. Call 800-788-6786 and learn how they can customize their program for you, your child, or your clients. Play Attention provides you with a personal executive function coach for free, unlimited support. Go to www.playattention.com for more information. So thank you again, Russ, and have a great day. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. You love podcasts, the stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.